Alright. Um, maybe Sean is going to be good. Uh, sorry, I'm a bit lost now. Okay. Welcome, everyone. Hi. <laughs> Welcome to the SGA Indie Soapbox. So, uh, we started, this is our third Indie Soapbox. And uh, we've started holding the soapbox because to give um, indie studios who don't have too much experience presenting a chance to present to the public crowd. So um, I think today we have the hide and seek team who are DigiPen grads. So graduated already, right? Almost. Oh, haven't graduated. Okay, almost graduated DigiPen grads. So today you're going to present about the game hide and seek. So take it away. Yeah, so. Um... Good evening, everyone. Um, before I begin, I'd like to thank SGGA um, and Gwen and Cheryl for this amazing opportunity. So this is the team. Uh, we're basically made of two designers, three artists, and six programmers. So my name is Melody, and together with me, um, I don't know if Sean will be here, but if not, it'll be Chen Shou, um, who will be talking about design. Uh, Isai will talk about audio. Um, Simon and Yu Yang will talk about art, and Ivan will end with tech. So we're a team of almost graduating DigiPen students, and in the past we've worked on projects that for some reason did very well, but were not necessarily games that we were proud of or would play ourselves. So we came here wanting to make um, an end product that we would actually enjoy. So the concept is simple. Um, it's a four-player party game where four captives are pitted against one another in a depraved Victorian scavenger hunt. So it's similar to these games, um, Dead by Daylight, Overcooked, and Betrayed at House on the Hill. So Dead by Daylight is because it's a multiplayer four versus one game where one person is a killer and the other four is a survivor. Um, Overcooked for its chaotic and social aspects where friends just like shot each other most of the time. And Betrayed House on the Hill because um, I wanted uh, the situation where the betrayer is chosen halfway through the game. So uh, I'll just play the trailer right now. Oh, there's no audio? Oh god, oh, wait. Yeah, it's because I shared... Uh, Hold on, let me change the... Because I shared the um, screen. Does this work? It's okay. flickering between the two applications. And I can't hear anything. For real. <laughs> um Does the sound work? Sorry. Still don't have. No? Don't have. No. Um okay, you know, I'll just play the Okay. Um go drive version. Does it have audio? Yep. yep. Okay. Welcome to Hyde's magnificent manner of mystery and madness. <laughs> the hunt begins. Go, go and gather those gems. Blood 
Blood, double kill! Monster kill! <laughs> Glorious! First Blood! Let's see which guest survives the night. Okay, so um, that was the trailer. Uh, the trailer doesn't really show the full gameplay loop, so I'll just um, talk about the gameplay now. So basically, there are four characters. Um, we have Soup Boy, the sidekick, uh, the doctor, and the maid. So the objective is simple. Um, the first player to collect 10 gems uh, wins the game. And gems are spawned periodically around the map. Uh, the twist is there's a day and night cycle, and at night, one character uh, transforms into a monster. We have the Gutulu on the left, the Jabber in the middle, and the Boomer on the right. So they are, those are um, the monster's names. And this is what the transition basically looks like. So one random player gets selected to become a monster. And each monster can attack the player, and basically killing a player as a monster was a gem. So not only that, um, each monster also has a unique ability. Um, Gotulu on the left uh, has this like speed boost ability. Um, Jabber in the middle uh, can ha has this um, teleport ability, and Boma on the right shoots like balls from its mouth that can stun players. So there are also items scattered around the map that helps you to collect gems or escape the monster. We have the, uh, there's a wind up key, which uh, gives a speed boost, um, the jackbox, which helps you to teleport, and also the ball that uh, can stun other players. So if you notice, this actually ties back to the monsters themselves. Um, you can see the, uh, the monster on the left has a, the wind up key on the back. Um, the Jabba in the middle is actually like a jack in the box, and the Boma on the right shoots the same boss that you are throwing. And so this sort of like ties the um, items like thematically also, so like they exist for a reason. And so this this is what it looks like um yeah, looks the same as the monster's abilities. And so that's the end of the um. Gameplay, um, I'll pass on to Tensho. Sean isn't here, right? Yeah. Pass on to Tensho to talk about the design. All right, so um, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yes. All right, okay. So I'm actually Tensho. Uh, I'll be taking over a uh, Sean segment for today because he couldn't make it for work. Lah. Okay, so let me just uh, start. Okay, so when we come to design, right, our team actually sat down at the initial stage of the production to actually think about what game style do we actually really want. Because we do know as students, as we move along, it's very easy to deviate from the initial plan. So hence, we actually tried to anchor down on a few pillars at the very get-go. So we, with that, we need some kind of like, you know, a guideline, something that we could use to start to design the game. And with that, we can actually come up with the features and the mechanics that we want to make the game so called, uh, as deep and as strong as we desire like to call it uh, fun. So it's more about just thinking, you know, what makes it fun and everything. So we actually decide on a few keywords and using that to actually help us to drive the direction we want to go. So we know we actually think about, you know, uh, you know we have such a short time everything, we don't have the luxury of time. So we more or less come from a bottom up approach of like, you know, we come up with these systems and stuff first. So like control or chaotic, competitive or cooperative, casual or hardcore. These are the few questions we actually ask ourselves at the very get go. So the first thing we actually decide on is number one, uh, chaos. Now we want the game to be replayable. But then, the understanding that we only have such a short uh, gameplay session, the only thing that we could more or less uh, play with is this thing called you know, randomness and unpredictability. You know, of how you know, the gems and items spawn randomly. Uh, gems spawn in an unpredictable manner. And of course, uh, us adding on with the way that players play differently, hopefully this can add on a different uh, so called, uh, layers 
of gameplay that we hope to instill and you know give players the excitement that we wish. Next up is competitiveness. As a cooperative game, you know, the whole team loves uh, PvP games, you know, as how players can, you know, have fun with one another. And we wanted to go back to the old times of, you know, a offline uh, land co-op games. So with that, we want to we actually take a very heavy inspiration from this game called uh, Betrayal on the Hill. I'm kind of sorry for the wrong name, yeah, but Betrayal on the House of the Hill, sorry. So with that, we actually want players to, you know, remain competitive and try to think, you know, which guy is the monster next, you know? Uh, am I going to get killed next? Uh, is this a night where I can die and let player instill the competitiveness and the kind of uh, level of strategy among themselves instead of the game pre uh, presenting it to them. Lastly is casual. Because it is a student game, we want players to get in fast and of course get out fast as well. So simple controls, easy to understand rules. We try to ensure that you know, the game rules, everything is consistent. And of course, the goal of the game is very simple, we just get 10 gems. Short, quick games, play dies at night, but the end night at 30 seconds as well, so they can get back to the game fast again. So in this kind of runs a very short loop, so that players can more or less quickly get back to the game and just have fun. And of course, the game is designed to last not more than 8 minutes, so players don't have to like commit such a large amount of time just to have fun with their friends. In essence, we what we call this a party game. So of course, moving next, you know, everything sounds uh, uh, simple enough. Uh, so if you look at the next slide, we got to start from somewhere. So obviously we start from paper prototypes to grey boxing levels. And next slide. And we actually get to see, you know, we actually got to over overhaul a lot of these levels repeatedly many times in order to get the way we run. Because it being a multiplayer game, map design is actually one of the very important things we need to uh, so called focus on. So next, as you can slowly see how the map slowly evolves to the final product. Uh, changing of the layout, the lighting, the levels, redirecting the player, and finally you can see this is our final product of like one of the map in uh, high and sick. Thank you guys. Uh, so uh, I'll pass on to Isa for audio. Hello everyone. Uh, I'm Isa, and I'm the audio designer of high and sick, and I'll guide you through our audio of the game. Uh, in making of the music, we took uh, extra considerations for the game loop uh, because it has this. Uh, Two, two different modes. There's a search for hunt mode and a hunt mode. Uh, I wanted to make both music uh, distinct and have a contrasting feel when one of the players become the monster. Uh, so you can take a look at the isolated audio. So this one is for the day. You can hear it's like it's very uh, thumpy thumpy. <laughs> As uh, my teammates like to call it, it's a very pom 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 pom. And for the night theme. These are the two main themes of the game, uh, and when it happens, that this change will be instant. Uh, as you can see, uh, the, the instruments that I used was uh, mainly the harpsichord for the main theme, uh, the double bass for the night theme, and choir for both. Uh, why choir? Because uh, the voice is pretty cool. <laughs> and uh, so for the sound effects, you can see they're actually distinct from the main game. They don't really follow the Victorian era, but we made it such that it's more familiar with uh, people. And for the announcer, uh, I did the announcer as well. Uh, and it just, uh, I added like a radio tiny thing. Player one has captured a gem. 
What a horrible act for a curse. Yeah, so you can see the, the theme instantly changes for that. Uh, and now I'll pass to Simon uh, to talk about the art. Hi, um, thanks, Lisa. Uh, so yeah, I'm Simon. I'll be starting off the art side of the game. So since the beginning of the creation of this game, our, our goal was to make uh, a lighthearted game with some horror elements in it. Uh, and so we went through several ideas, and what we landed on was uh, the Victorian theme, right? And so why did we choose Victorian? We felt that the, the Victorian look itself was uh, very iconic, especially if you, you picture in your mind the era that it was in. Uh, so it's sort of like this industrial, but still very like, the, it was very fashionable. The environment design was very uh, iconic as well. And it's very memorable and unique. Uh, it really suited our theme really well because of this like progression of the technology as well as, um, you know, there may be like some hints of like people experimenting with some things. So there's like a little bit of the mystery there. So there's like a possibility of some taboo experiments going on. And this uh, led to the inspiration behind like all the like different traps in the house, as well as some of the creation of the monster is what, uh, this is what inspired it. Uh, yeah, so I'll be moving on to the different uh, references. I'll just go through them really quickly. Uh, because of, of course we chose Victorian, there's such a wealth of information. Uh, that we could draw from. So we went through like the different professions, uh, you know, like uh, the different fashion as well as, so, you know, like the different cultures that were inside the era in the first place. We need to make sure that we didn't go outside of the era. Uh, yeah, so this was the little bit of film. We also uh, researched a little bit on the kind of the style of characters that we wanted because it was a top, top down game. So yeah, so like the bigger hands and the thicker limbs kind of like uh, stylized in a way uh, worked for us. Uh, so yeah, we'll just quickly move on to the next one and the environment as well. Uh, yeah, just this is for the male character, and you can move on to the environment after this. Yeah, so this is just the environment. We explore a little bit of like Luigi's mansion and the style and feel of what we wanted the mansion to look like, and uh, yeah, more mention, more Victorian architecture itself. So next, I'll be going on to uh, sticking to the theme of the game. So this is one of our main core tenants in the game. So we actually had to uh, make sure that the character designs needed to be internally consistent with both the game world and the mechanics of the game itself. And I'll explain that uh, further because since the players had to choose their own character and since they all had played the same way, the only thing that distinct was distinct was the design and the appeal. So um, yeah, so I knew from the start that I wanted two males and two females. So I tried to appeal, uh, make their designs appeal to as many player types as possible, right? The, whether it's the cute kind of character, the cool looking one, or the, you know, the more alluring character. I want each player, each individual that played the game to kind of have their own kind of motivations for selecting the character. I wanted them to actually like the character that they um, uh, selected. So to adhere to the theme, which was Victorian, it was also very important to us that we uh, make sure that they were consistent with the era that they were from. So next, uh, I think it was, uh, Another thing that we had to strongly remind ourselves that it was a motley crew of helpless adventurers versus like this deadly toy themed abomination. What it means is that uh, we have to reinforce this sense of danger of the monster coming close to you, right? And in order to have that sense of danger, the players actually have to look visually weaker than the monsters. But in the end, no one really wants to play a character who is weak looking, right? They wanted to play a character that is interesting. So this was like sort of the balance game that we had to play around, which was uh, designing a character that didn't look too strong, but still visually interesting, even though they had to be civilians, you know, they weren't like some League of Legends kind of uh, complex character. Uh, yeah, next is the, for the explanation of it, is the rule of cool versus design that makes sense. So this is kind of like some of the designs that we went through for one of the characters. And yeah, you know, we can't, we can't just slap on any kind of character, like any kind of armor onto the character because it wouldn't make sense, right? So we had to go through and see what kind of profession we wanted. And I couldn't choose the pirate character, for example, uh, because maybe it was too aggressive. So we landed on the fortune teller, which uh, the psychic fortune teller-ish sort of character. So it still looked kind of appealing, but you know, wasn't like a, a kind of profession that was known for to be like, very combatant. And lastly, we have the monsters. Uh, so the monsters needed to feel threatening, but you know their shape and silhouette needed to feel instantly identifiable and follow the theme of, you know, again, Victorian. Right, so we actually moved away from sort of like a grotesque looking kind of character to a more 
it's like wacky kind of thing. So this would be know, this toy theme, which was actually suited it very, very particularly. Uh, Yun Yang is our creature designer as well. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, so you can see here, they look very appealing and still very dominant. So even though they had this toy theme to them, they still could be very um, menacing mm -hmm. in, the, in the house itself. And still capture that lightheartedness that we really wanted in the game. So it wasn't like a super scary kind of place, but still there. Uh, the Cthulhu, like uh, what we said, was, you know, after the wind-up toy, because, you know, you can wind it up and you can go really fast. And then the Jabber is like a jack-in-a-box, so it's meant to surprise you. So this is why he could, like, you know, jump around and teleport, because uh, that's the nature of uh, jack-in-a-box. And lastly, the Boomer is shit after, you know, those balls that, you know, kids play with on the street. And I think if you get a ball thrown on you in the head, it can be quite disorientating. So that's why, you know, they could stun players. And this was all their design in the first place. So just to keep to our theme, had the lightheartedness, and yeah, it's achieved what like suited the mechanics really well. And lastly, yeah, it's just this was some of the re the reiteration. So it's kind of like finding a balance, getting feedback, and all that. And next, I hand over to uh, Yun Yang, who talk about the top down visual design. Hi, I'm Yun Yang, and yeah, I'm just gonna uh, share a little bit on the practical challenges of our game art. So. When developing this game, we got four characters we need to produce and three monsters. We have a very tight time schedule and we need to develop, uh, deliver characters every three weeks on top of other assignments. So if you need to be 100% sure your idea will work, we always start with 3D. So we went down to model simple versions of our characters and you know just prototype, uh, go through rapid prototyping just to make sure that from the game angle, they look as appealing as possible. And yeah, so this is the concept art that was created uh, directly from this 3D blockouts. It was uh, it really helped our process uh, to speed up. So next, I will be talking about designing because um, in the whole process of creating the game, we uh, we had to create um, we had to create these three monsters, and we really had to plan together with the game designers in terms of mechanics because. The mechanics affect the design of the monster, and it also affects the gameplay. As such, you know, when once we decided that, all right, the boomer, the ball monster, is going to be spitting balls, then he needs a large mouth. Or the jack in a box, he's going to teleport across long distances. Maybe let's give him a box so that he can, you know, pop in and out of it. And for Cthulhu, yeah, she's going to go fast, so got to give her that key to start spinning. And all of this had to be decided before we even went down to creating the models. And because of this, we cut through a lot of potential problems in the end stage of our design. So when we're designing our characters, you know, you always steal knowledge from the gods. So right here we have that, you know, very common Dota 2 workshop of how to create the character in a top-down view. It's always about silhouette, silhouette, silhouette. You know, you've got the key identifying shape, ah, some riot work, you know. Uh, the design from the back and the front, you know, it has got to be recognizable so that you can tell where the character is facing and can differentiate between each character. You know? So there's a lot of tweaking between the shapes of our designs, as you can see in the next slide. Uh, Simon has taken through a lot of pains you know, to draw the character in that certain angle so that, yeah, we can be sure this is going to work and um, there won't be any problems during gameplay. So moving on, uh, I'd like to talk about detail economy because the reality of our game is that we are playing on a split screen, you know, four screens on a computer, uh, just mesh together and not, not only that, but we have a huge environment and the characters are relatively small. So in terms of design, as you can see here, there are a lot of details, but many of them have been scaled up so that they'll be readable from a distance. Let me just illustrate to you the problem. So, um, for example, we have this doctor character here and this is the actual gameplay in the next slide. So, yeah, um, we got our character, but I need you to enhance and enhance. Enhance? No. Uh, yeah. So it's really important for us, you know, as we're designing, to keep the final look of the game in mind. How big are the characters going to be? And what's the smallest detail we can manage to fit on the screen? And because of this, you know, uh, it always went with the mantra of big shapes, big statements. Don't go small. All right. So finally, I also like to talk about the contrast against the background and the characters because we also have three levels. So how we really managed that across the development was to actually uh, test them. You know, we'll take it out, we'll take screenshots out, we'll turn it to grayscale and see, all right, is this character popping out as it should? And if not, we'll adjust the textures and adjust the background uh, to fit you know, the kind of contrast we wanted. 
So in the next slide, we have the environments, you know, the process that we went through, the pain overs, moving on to the final environment, and then just some further tweaks, you know, to get the exact look that we want. So now I'll pass the time over to Ivan, who will be talking to us about the tech. And that would be me. All right. So a wise man once told me that an ambitious game needs an ambitious engine. So I want you to take a good look at this slide because we won't be here for long. I'm about to go into more detail in three, two, one, boom. Art pipeline. All right. So when you're developing an art pipeline, one thing that was very important is to make it PBR. Why PBR? Because artists have access to this tool called Substance Painter, which lets them export a material easily into our engine. So that is one thing. You can see the different materials cycling on the left. On the right, you can see a shader graph. What's a shader graph? It is basically a graph representation of shader code. This allows artists to create code, uh, shaders without needing to write any code themselves because most of them hadn't taken the course by then. If you look on the top, you can see that this is a shader for a water material. Right. Next slide. We're going to talk about our animation because um, there are two ways that you can go about making animations in a game engine. And we went with the way that made it easy to import an animation from Maya into the engine. On the left, you can see our tutorial and uh, you can see the bone of the camera moving away from the ghost. As a result, when our artist imported the tutorial into the engine, it was just drag and drop, no hus, no fuss. Lastly, uh, we're just going to go into a bit of detail about the engine and how we opted to do Vulcan in order to support the intense graphical requirements of the game. So Vulcan's pretty hard, so we needed five times the manpower. This is to support four times the screens. It and it required 16 times the code. So yeah, big problem. And lastly, networking, it just works locally. Right, so uh, to talk about tech production, you might ask, why did we make all of those features? You know, The truth is, it really is all about the game. No one cares about your engine tech. No one cares about some obscure graphics feature. Everyone just looks at your game. So we made these tools and features. We polished them to a mirror side and made them accessible to the non-programmers in our team so that the artists and designers can bring their dream game to life. Let's go back to the feature list. There's a lot of things that I didn't cover. You can see the list is, uh, yeah. So if you want to know more, please ask in the Q&A section. The programmer who wrote it is probably lurking in the chat somewhere. But the point is, tech doesn't exist in a vacuum, and every feature here exists for the game. It's a multiplayer game where four captives are pitted against each other in a deranged Victorian scavenger hunt. And that's it. We have been the High and Seek team. Please check out our game. Any questions? Thank you. Thanks to the team for presenting. Do you have any questions? Or comments even. I think the game looks really cool. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, I mean, it's a really impressive game. I mean, <laughs> compared to, yeah, yeah. I mean, for a Digipen game, it's really great student game, considering the heavy workload from all the other modules. And I'm really impressed by the tech as well, the back end, uh, even though you didn't really dive into the details, but from the whole list there, and going with Vulcan, which isn't really taught per se, uh, as a formal lesson, as a formal lecture class, uh, really impressive stuff. Thank you.
<laughs> is it? Uh, I mean, why not? Anybody else interested? I mean, don't just do it for me. No point. But definitely something I'd like to, to follow up on, I guess. You know, private chats with them and stuff like that. Uh, they're kind of irrelevant now, but uh, we, uh, Mel, can you go to the feature slide? Uh, bye. Uh, wait up. Uh, it's just previous twice. This one, right? Yeah. Uh, which would you like to ask about and specifically? Uh, I think two main things that I'm interested in is uh, the HDR and the rendering pipeline, uh, and okay. also the networking. I think yeah, networking is really cool. Um, is this when I, I when I arrow the Vulkan programmer in the chat to talk first? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, HG, you want, uh, you're able to speak up? Uh, hello, can you guys hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah, so you want to know about the HDR and the, uh, as the pipeline? Correct, Matthew? Yeah, I guess more of the pipeline and I guess how you guys imported the animations and stuff like that. What's, what's the pipeline, asset pipeline like? Ah, okay. Uh, to be honest, this will be uh, the asset importing part is more of uh, Joseph's territory. Uh, is Joseph around? <laughs> Just a quick highlight. Okay, so it, uh, okay, since he's, it's, he doesn't seem to be around, I'll just go into quickly, such detail. Yeah, I'll just quickly cover the uh, the asset importing, uh, at least for models and all that, right? The main thing we are using to import is SIMP. So he Joseph's job was to uh was to take the SM library, take the models that our uh, artists exported, and then somehow bring it into the game and work out all the little kinks and make sure that the animation works. And so when once, are, are you do you want to know about how the designers use it or like how exactly? I mean the uh or the, yeah, I mean do you, I guess more yeah yeah. So so from designer, the designer right? standpoint and the artist standpoint, right? How easy right. is it like to pull stuff in and stuff like that? Right. So as uh, all they have to just do drag is and drop and yeah, just, just drag and drop the files in, uh, into the fo folder, and then from our editor, if I recall correctly, they should be able to just uh, either just drag it out, and then yeah, I think if I recall correctly, they should. Uh, it's been a while, but uh, if I recall correctly, they can just drag it out and it'll be in the in the scene. And uh, we'll generate all the necessary stuff necessary when they do so. Yeah, the animation editor allows you to plug in any uh, any of the animations you've baked before in a DCC and just play it in uh, the game itself, the editor. Yeah. Permission okay, to interrupt. Thanks. I'm launching the editor right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, well, well, that's putting up. Um, now, I'll just talk briefly about the HDR stuff. The HDR here, we uh, the HDR here that we talk about is mainly uh, just the fact that we work with the um, when we do the lights and all that, right? When we render it, we and we store we do different shading to handle uh, all the rendering stuff, so that uh, which gives us the ability to store the light information, the light all the lit pixels as uh, in a higher in a higher uh, degree of uh, not, not, not exactly resolution but basically using a float like a full float 16 for one channel rather than you know the, the usual um, eight, uh, 8 bits for a uh, one byte for for one channel right so when we did that we were able to rest ourselves away from the normalized zero to one which means that if your colors are, uh, say, uh, how to say, if, if for example, your light is very bright, right? Normally it would hit one or go above one and then we'll just clamp, uh, the, the system will just clamp it down to one and then you just see a white blip there, right? But then now we are able to preserve the color and do some color grading on top of it. Uh, uh, you know, color grading is afterwards, but basically we are able to preserve the colors and then, um, apply a simple formula to kind of squish them back down so that the very bright lights don't just cause a whiteout, but we can still see the, the, the hint of the color that it originally came from. So 
that's what they mean by a higher di a high dynamic range. Then the LUT part is just uh, after we did that for our artists to control the mood of the game, uh, they we are able to load in artist generated lookup tables, uh, which basically just changes the uh, we just takes an existing color and map it over to a, a new color, and and that lets us set the mood for the game. That answered the question for the HDR LUT part. Yeah, I think in fact Ivan is ready with uh, his stream just to show the, the different features in the editor. Uh, is it moving? It uh, my screen capture doesn't seem to work. I think I can see a cursor moving. Yeah. Is is the ghost moving? The ghost itself is not moving, but you're wiggling the editor. So it works. Okay, so this is just our animation editor. Uh, which we didn't show off uh, because uh, we wanted it to be more about the arts this time around. But basically, the animation uh, tutorial is not the best place to show it, but we, uh, we use the tutorial because my computer is potato. Okay, so basically, we can add different states. We can add different layers to the animations. Uh, this, and this exclamation mark means that it is broken. So yeah, uh, our... Uh, you can uh, attach different clips. In this case, this welcome is the little animation that she does. And when we said that we imported it straight from Maya, why, why, I believe the camera is here, right? Yep. So this camera is uh, joined on the skeleton, which is imported in an entity. The, the camera settings match the Maya settings exactly. And so when you play the editor, I'm really scared because my laptop is serious. My desktop is a potato at, at this point, but you can see that the what camera is on the bone, and then it will just follow whatever it is. So yeah, yeah. we make the animation to the bone itself. So when, once the camera is pointed to the bone, it will move along with the big animation. Mm. And of course, uh, the animation editor, oh, the animation animator also allows you to blend between different states uh, and specify transitions. So if I move over to another point on the scene, I believe this monster has more stuff. Uh, you can sp did I specify any transitions for this? Ah, yes. So for example, we can specify a land to idle transition and it will exit over uh, 0 0.8 seconds. I believe it's either seconds or normalized time. Uh, it should be seconds or it might only be that way in the C-sharp script. Oh yeah, uh, the actual time that it will the transition takes is only 0 0.2 seconds. And um, yeah, you can also specify the speed. You can set it to zero to freeze the animation. You can also go negative to go in reverse. So we didn't do the animation previews because uh, we just figured that we can just run it in the game and uh, the artist can see what's going on. So as for importing, it, the resources are auto-detected when they are in the project folder and then automatically reloaded when they are replaced. So the rest is handled by code. That is all on the and on the asset pipeline. Yep. Thank you very much for answering my questions in such detail. Um, really giving people a peek behind the scenes with the editor and all. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Um, if you were to ask about networking, that would be on me. But I don't know if I'm hogging the spotlight too much. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else with questions? Okay. Uh, I can I can talk about networking a bit, but I don't actually have slides on it because the slides that we had was more of tech production. Because I'm the networking champion, but I knew absolutely nothing about networking when I started, and I only had three months to do it. So, uh, in terms of tech, uh, the networking model is based on the tribes networking model, which basically just means we only send data. If we keep track of what the client has received. And the client will tell us what data they have received through ACK, uh, acknowledging a packet. Uh, and the server keeps a, a bit mask of all the data that it has sent the client so far. When we retransmit data to the client, we will only send the latest data, data. We will almost never retransmit data unless it is required. For example, a game event. An example of a game event might be picking up an item. 
because every player must see a, an item has been picked up. Or using an item, because you need to play those effects, so on and so forth. So those events are done through RPC calls, uh, which are reflected by C Sharp. Fortunately, Mono gives us the Mono framework gives us a reflection engine, which is easy to use. So that would be on the event side. I believe I've covered both. To summarize, it's more there are two ways to synchronize the game state. One is through events, and one is through the engine. The engine is for real time updates and will only update to the latest game state sent by the server. Whereas on the event side, uh, on the event side, it must guarantee and it must be in sequence. It's not just the latest update. We, the events must play in sequence. Otherwise, the game state could end up in some horrible state that no one has any idea what's going on. I hope that made sense for people who are interested in networking. Yeah. Oh, oh, Minoru, you can go ahead. Okay, Sabo Minoru. Wow, I just came in, yeah. Sorry, I forgot, the, forgot there was this, this thing going on. I missed the whole first half of the presentation. It's okay, we recorded it. What was the total development time uh, on the project overall? We started when we arrived back from Redmond in August. And we ended a little bit after the project ended. Uh, our, we submitted it to the Digipen Games Gallery in early June, which makes an eight month development time. Uh, we did not want to start when the semester started because we knew we were going to do some pretty serious stuff like Vulcan and networking eventually. So we needed a buffer. So the school actually uh, gave you, uh, ordinarily the school would, would set a, a development time of what, six months? Five, Five or six months. Okay. I mean, it's good, good to understand that this was uh, scoped out in eight and, and finished in eight months. Hmm. Are there any plans to bring this game further beyond the student project? I think everyone's tired of it. <laughs> uh, so it's more like a, a stepping stone now. Uh, you can say that? We also at the point in time where we are currently looking for jobs, internships. So it's kind of a crossroads on this one. Yeah. Although personally, I think it would be really nice if, you know, there was like, um, what was it again? Uh, I mean, it, my, it, it went most... beyond our student project. If, if it goes beyond our student project. Forced it to the switch. Oh yes. Yeah, I think the the oh my gosh, should be a Sean. great platform for this actually. Yeah, because I have some idea. Uh, I think all of us kind of do. Basically, Digipen does own the license. So, uh, unfortunately, we would have to, we can keep the mechanic. The mechanic isn't copyrighted, but the branding and everything, the ingenious name and the fantastic art, uh, none of it is allowed to be ported. So, we would have to remake literally everything to port it. Even the code, it, you, can't, you can't bring over to, the, to a spiritual successor? Well, if you were to ask either the networking or the Falcon programmers, we would tell you that the code is nowhere near sustainable. <laughs> we made a lot of mistakes. Just so chiming in here on the... Sorry. Go ahead, man. Go oh, ahead. Sure. Yeah, yeah. No, I was talking about talking to Digipen and like they, they're okay with you actually bringing out your game. They're willing to transfer the ownership. 
as long as you give them credit and stuff like that. Like credit where credit is due. Yep. Sorry, I, yeah, I was, I was just informed by my producer that uh, th you can get the IP from the Japan. I think yeah. they changed. Just, there was a game called Lurking before, but it wasn't released on Steam under Lurking, so I got a bit confused. Yeah, yeah, that's typhoon. Yeah. It sounds like they will require some kind of attribution, but uh, other than that, it's different from the model that was uh, used on on lurking and typhoon. Uh. I, I agree with Sean. This game lives on the Switch. <laughs> that was the initial vision. Uh, hello, hello. Yeah, uh, I have a question for the artist. Uh. All right. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so like for this game, right? Like I do understand that uh, it is made like multiplayer first. So it is meant to be played in like like a like a split screen where there are like four different screens in one uh in one uh like monitor. So I'm just wondering like uh, what are the steps of like that you guys take right in order to keep like your visual elements readable in such like a small screen, uh, especially like in a top down kind of view. Uh, because I do understand that uh, from looking at your game, like uh, there is a lot of action going on. There's a lot of uh, things that are happening in different screens. So I'm just wondering, how do you design your characters? And then also maybe for the designers, like how did you design your visual effects in order to maintain uh, readability of the action in a small uh, screen economy? Yep. Wow. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, let me see. I think um, things to come like it all has to come as a package. So we we not only had to care about like how we design the characters, but we also had to care about the environment and basically every visual element on screen needs to be carefully curated in order to make sure that nothing is distracting at any point in the process. Like even when we're doing the UI, for example, you know where we split the screen. There was also a chance for us to slip up on our uh, artistic decision to, to make something that's a little bit too detailed and would draw the eye away from the action. So yeah, it was a very constant and rigorous process of actually making sure that uh, everything was readable and the only way we could find out was through feedback. So what we would do is, um, for example, the environments, we'll just go with the general principle of, all right, let's keep the saturation of the colors low. Uh, the forms and shapes need to, needed to be relatively simple and we'll try to keep the details down low wherever we needed the characters to stand out. As for things like uh, the gem, we would have to enforce like, yeah, we only need to select a color that is never used in many of the other things in the game and it is uh, a color that instantly recognizable from far away. We also have to use the lighting. so. We use purple lighting in order to make sure that that thing stands out in the middle of the night. Um, mm -hmm. That's for the gem. For the characters itself, I'm not sure. Simon, do you want to uh, share a bit of the experience? Yeah. Uh, just before you start, uh, right. because like this, like a top-down kind of game, so it's uh, very difficult to try to get like the features out from that point of perspective. So oh, yeah. uh, it would be nice if you can share like what do you have to do in order to keep the forms, the syllabus, uh, recognizable from that uh perspective uh yeah i can i can touch a little bit on the uh design i think uh actually if, do you do you want to go uh, all the way back in the slides if you can i mean if it helps to talk uh, over your point that would be great uh yeah mel do you want to could you help me sorry all right all right uh Uh, yeah, I think if you go down to the um, the one after the the League of Legends one, yeah, it's quite it's quite a ways. Um, 
yeah, it's quite a ways down. So this initially was like the first ever uh, time like I actually tackled the design. And uh, yeah, I think at the, at the start, I kind of noticed that a lot of the things were getting lost in the silhouette itself. So actually starting out with a blocking of um, what, is, what a character would look like top down is actually what we started with, you know, like uh, we got the camera angle first and then we sort of uh, designed from there. And then I realized that I needed to go big Right, so it started off with the since since the first character was like the mate, it was pretty easy because uh, you know we go with the skirt, right? And then the hair would get lost too much in the detail. So uh, since she was already round, uh, like I figured that the hair could actually follow the same theme, so everything went that way. Uh, as for like subsequent characters, uh, you can you can go back to like maybe a lineup, maybe. Uh, yeah, for the subsequent characters, right? I think I kept in mind, uh, like the. The prop, the uh, let's say that like it it plays into the a little bit of the animation, uh, as well because you need to kind of think about all these kind of things when you are kind of making the characters. So they would be throwing items, they would be running. So the hands were like the thing that I knew that needed to be highlighted the most. So that's where you kind of like blow them up into those kind of things, and then you needed to choose your spots. Like for example, the shoulders were another kind of spot that uh, I chose for getting that top-down read. And so moving on to like to the doctor, you know, that coffin would be the iconic one. And then having the hat as well. And then having that mask, um, you know, because the face will hardly be seen, right? So like the mask would be, would give a clear read to where the face is kind of, oh yeah, to give where the kind of character is pointing. So you kind of need to keep in mind that you needed a very uh, important front face, and you need an important back face. So the coffin would be at the back. Um, you know, the character's large bobbed hair would be at the back. So you, and then they need to be completely distinct from your uh, front view as well. So the front view had the mask, front view had the apron, the front view of the boy had the suit uh, as well. And then that also ties into a little bit of the color as well. So picking a dominant color was very important. Uh, the top down view as well. And I think that pr would provide some, that provides a little bit of challenge uh, because mm -hmm. working around one particular color itself would be quite uh, difficult. Uh, as well. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I hope that answers the question. If you want to know specifically, like, which character are you interested in, or like, just in general. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I will look at the uh, character sheets, right? And uh, I noticed uh, for the Kutuli character, like, on this current, like, slide, like, is the most, the bottom left one. And the, uh, I think the Chomper, the, the bottom right one. Yeah. Like uh, from the top-down view, uh, they have uh, kind of like similar silhouettes and set in a sense that they're kind of like a ball shape uh, from the point of view. Right. So uh, you you also uh, say that like the animations also uh, differentiates like the how the uh, characters are being recognized in the space. So mm -hmm. would you care to share like how did you use uh, animation like in terms of to differentiate like the different characters like in like the action? Oh yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, I do realize that the, the shapes of them are pretty similar from the top-down view. And we did what we could to actually uh, try to differentiate them, you know, with the tentacles of Cthulhu sticking out from the wheelchair and for the ball monster to be kept as round as possible. So if you're talking about animation, well, it's all about contrast. So we'll talk about like, you know, which part of the character moves the most. For uh, the example right here, uh, we can see that the Cthulhu character actually has two points of motion, one of which is the back, which is the slowly rotating key. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this huge yellow thing that's rotating would immediately get your attention from far away. And you kind of know that that's Cthulhu, because if you look over to the round uh, boomer on the other side, uh, yeah, his tail is really small. It's non-existent. Instead, mm -hmm. what you're going to look at is that huge uh, patchwork on his back as well as uh, mm -hmm. the chomping movements and the VFX use as well. So you're also talking about the, uh, the designers just now. Yeah, the VFX uh, does play a huge uh, role in di differentiating the two. So um, for example, the boomer, as he chomps, you know, it's just that huge jaws coming down. But mm -hmm. for Cthulhu, it's a trail. So it's, you know, line versus uh, that chomping action. So yeah, uh, in terms of that, we tried to make it as unique as possible. Okay, uh, that's good. So I assume that uh, for uh, the different uh, monsters, they have like different uh, attack patterns. 
out to them, right? Oh yeah, uh, because the ball monster. Um, I think we also uh talk about uh, movement speed. So, um, the Jack in the Box actually moves the slowest, followed by the ball monster, and then Cthulhu, which moves the fastest. So that's one of the things you have to look out for. Um, mm. as they are walking, as they are running, you know, the ball monster tends to flail around. You know, just like ah, and uh, on the other hand, you have you know the bouncing motion of the Jack in the Box and mm. uh, just you know the cool sliding motion of the Zulu. As for the attack patterns, well, yeah, uh, Jack in the Box clearly has the largest range. You know, people love it because you can just slap anyone from a distance. Yeah, the Zulu is dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. It's dangerous. It's that stabbing motion in a straight linear pattern towards the front. So it's all about aiming your attack properly and making sure you're not caught by its speed. And for a ball monster, you know, it's really just uh, it's just an animal, you know. Uh, it spits out the balls, you know, to try and catch you and then it comes in for the kill. So it's not much in terms of accuracy. But, you know, if you see those balls coming towards you, you know, you have to run away because the moment you're caught there, it's going to catch up to you and it's going to kill you. Mm. Uh, I think it, uh, what he didn't touch on was also, also how, like how much of the scope, how big of a scope it was in the first place. Because each monster kind of have, has a different everything. Like they are, because of the way they designed their idle animations were different. The way they uh, moved were different. So keeping mm. that in mind when designing as well, because uh, you don't want to go too crazy for one particular character, and then one the other one is mm. like kind of crazy. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think if you see the, if it, there's not shown here, but then the Cthulhu, for example, has like a coughing animation, which I thought was really nice. Because, you know, like the grandma, she's old and then she coughs uh, and everything. And then the, the, the bald, the, the bald boomer is kind of like, um, has this like wide eyed mm. expression. So like even the way he moves, is like a bumbling sort of like, uh, cutesy kind of walk. And then the grandma is like, has, is like moving on a wheelchair. So yeah, mm. that kind of differentiates them, uh, in the animation. Mm. as well if you look at his early designs for his concepts they, I think the, having the similar silhouette was what we struggled a lot with because uh, early on her silhouette was actually quite similar to the ball as well mm. alright thank you yeah so uh, a question to the designers so uh, I do notice that your game uh, is being played like in a fixed uh, angle so in a sense that uh, the players are Kind of like constrained to this one back to the angle and the camera like follows them around so you can't really like, rotate the angle in order to uh to uh see like where the the players are coming from so i do understand that uh doing so there is some considerations that you have to do in your level design in such a way that uh at the particular point of view there should be like nothing overlapping uh between like the uh characters and the camera so I'm just wondering, like, what are, like the uh, what are the ways that you had to did right, or how did you uh work around this construction in order to develop for your levels? Assuming uh you guys have like three levels, so yeah, just a general that's like a general strategy would be great. So just to clarify, your question is something along the lines of given uh, design. a fixed yeah. um, perspective, at how, what did they have to consider to get the, uh, to de while designing this game? Uh, yes, yeah. Because I assume, uh, I noticed that uh, your games have like statues and walls. Uh, so i uh, just wondering like what uh, you guys have to do in order to make sure that uh, Nothing is uh, blocking the character and the player. Right. So yeah, yeah, like you said, yeah. No, I asked this question. Sorry, I asked this question because, like, I uh, during like the playtesting sessions, I do notice that sometimes that I find myself in corners and I can't really see like where the characters are. So I'm just wondering whether you have like rectified that issue. Uh, I'm pretty sure we have rectified most of them, <laughs> but I okay. can't say for sure. Uh, so what we did when we... Okay, sorry for the traffic noises. Okay, it's gone. Never mind. So for, for most of the overhauls of the levels, right? Because our initial levels actually had a lot of those problems. 
Um, we actually designed the levels uh, from camera angle to camera angle. So, for example, uh, we will start building the levels from the player spawn point. Of course, we already had a, a basic layout, right? But for, for example, we'll have this camera angle, the camera angle that we are playing at, at the character. And we just make sure that everywhere he moves, he knows where he is. And so we just go to each corner and keep, keep trying to iterate through how we can do it. It's, it's kind of slow and arduous process, but it has to be done. Yeah, it's, it's not, not much about design thing and more about being uh, thorough with uh, just how the, things, right? the visuals are presented. Uh, yeah. All right. Okay. Um, so just uh, one, one final question, uh, like, uh, because this is like a local multiplayer game and uh, I think that somewhere down like this, the second half of like the game uh, module, uh, you guys decided to do uh, multiplayer instead. So uh, I just wondering like, how would uh, a client, like a network client would uh, display the game? Is it a single screen or is it like a four screen? Like, well, you can uh, go to the slide where it says it just works. Yes, but uh, could you define like what is just works? So it's a single screen. This is the entire screen of the network gameplay. Okay. It was recorded yesterday. So you can see that the YY's UI has been moved to the bottom left. And mm -hmm. instead of a circle in the middle, it is a quarter circle. I should not be talking right now. Why would I please take the lead? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> well, yes. um, I mean, I think the best way to play it definitely is through online. Um, granted, you know, that there are no issues with the network they are, you're playing on. So this mm -hmm. gives you like the best view. Um, yeah, if you're really going to show someone the game, it would be nice to play in this, you know, uh, large format for this uh, for the networking mode. Mm. I think okay. it was also double work as well because you know it had to redesign the UI to fit a single screen, uh, and before it was four screens as well. But it does it does improve the view for the characters a little bit because you know you can see the characters clearly yeah. a little bit more. But, yeah. yeah. All right. Um, uh, I forgot to mention something. Um, you were about to say something. Uh. So. Uh. You guys have like a different uh kind of like other sets of views for like the different modes of play, right? Like for four screens versus like single screens. Oh, oh no, they're all the same. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But is there any uh like is there any like difference between like playing four screens? Like uh, is there like any like uh a benefit? Like, is that, like the flow is different or something? Right. Um, the flow is generally the same. It's just that you get a lot of uh, you can you get the screen of friends. You know, yeah, you can't see, see where they are. Yeah, that's the fun of it, I guess. You know, just play dirty, man. It's all about betrayal yeah. here. Yeah, I think okay. the the energy is a little bit different when you have four screens at once because you can, if you have spectators, especially, you can see a lot of people are cheering, and yeah. like, yeah, just the chaos is much higher. Yeah. And also, like on a local multiplayer, uh, there's always this like uh, screen sniping where you can just like look at the other player's screen to generally know where they are. Yeah, I think that's encouraged. I think in the gameplay yeah. because uh, racing with other players to where they were trying to go and depriving them of the gem that they wanted is like part of the fun. It's mm -hmm. also an arrow, so yeah, yeah. Well, actually, actually we, we found that the testers liked it a lot more <laughs> when they started screen sniping each other. Yeah. Uh, can I add something? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, I'm going to share the editor again, uh, if you don't mind changing so much. Because uh, you, can't, you kind of caught Sean off guard just now, so I'm going to cover, I'm going to tell you what, what decisions that Sean made, actually. Uh, so uh, the theater level shot is the one that is described in our slides, uh, if you guys can see. It's sort, of, it's sort of Sean's baby, so yeah. Uh, you might not. Uh, one of the decisions that we made was that uh, 
Okay, so the cam the editor camera is sort of in the games. About it's about the game angle. Notice that all the doors are pointing towards the camera. They're all pointing downwards. None of them point away. So the doors will never be occluded by a wall. Okay. So you know exactly where the doors are. <laughs> right? Another thing is we try our best to keep elevation going towards upwards in the level. So you see the stairs they go upwards in this way. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and down here, the elevation is much less. And so to the point where if you go into the game view, you can just barely make out the... Uh, even when the player is completely behind you, you sort of know that the player is like right behind you. So we try our best to avoid those kind of elevations in our level of designs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, in the sense that you try to avoid the elevations uh, that are from like the bottom right corner. Yeah. So you want to like uh, so bottom, bottom right or bottom left. left. Mm-hmm. That would uh, possibly occlude the character. And if, they, if we do, it will be short. Yeah. But yeah. not not too deep, I guess. All right. Okay. I think uh, that's kind of like the answer I was expecting for the design questions. Mm. Okay. Uh, Sean, Sean's very shy, so. Uh, okay. It's hard there, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you very much. Yes. Uh, yeah, I had a question. After this entire barrage of questions, um, could could the designers go into some detail about like, uh, in terms of map balancing and gameplay balancing? What are some stuff you kind of or what like what are the big issues you um notice doing like play testing and how do you rebalance the gameplay or the maps to fix this? Or was it kind of like just you can't just work off the bat and you're just keep polishing it from there? Sorry, can you repeat the last part of your question? Uh, so I was wondering, in terms of the like map balancing and like gameplay, right? Like, was it a very iterative process? Like, were there constantly things that you had to rebalance and fix, or was it, in a sense, um, you knew what you were doing at the very start? And no, yes. man, bro. It was crazily <laughs> iterative, man. It, um, yeah, it was very tiring, man. <laughs> uh, basically, uh, I don't... Because I just came from work. I, I really don't know if they show you the slides of the theater. Uh, but, I, I, I have a general idea of how the map layout is. Yeah. Okay, so the thing is, the theater you see, the purple-looking one, right? Yep. Is a complete, complete overhaul from the first one we did, which had a lot of problems. Mm. So some of the problems we actually had was the map was too big. The map had too many places where uh, you could... F- too many places where you could jump from. I would see, see my uh, yeah, yeah. stream, right? Uh, can you go back to two slides, I think? Back, back. Yeah. See, the old, the old one was very, very complex. Uh, you have a lot of ways to enter the center, but a lot of not a lot of ways you could move from the center outwards, right? Mm. So, uh, in the new map, we decided to have a two-way workflow for the uh, theater in, in a sense that people in the middle could go to the sides and corners, and the people from the sides and corners could also go back to the middle, but not in the same path. Right, okay. Uh, if you play the old one, I guarantee you, you will be very frustrated and you'll be very lost. <laughs> I see. Yes. I, I think it got to the point where like, uh, to maybe un- except for the last few weeks, every single week we'd be, we would be playtesting a new version of the game that was quite different from the previous week's one. Yeah. And then, yeah, I think we, we would always look forward to every of those playtest sessions because we're wondering what kind of game we were going to play next as well. Hmm. So if you go to the next slide, right? Okay, yeah, you go to the next slide and you see that even the colors that we use are actually help the player, you know, uh, understand where they are on the map. So the, you have different shades of purple for different elevations. Uh, you have the brown colors for the stage and the backstage. Yeah, so... Yeah, everything was very, very iterative. We, our initial levels that we had from paper prototype to gray boxing, uh, they are completely different from what we have now. 
Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, then, if you don't mind me asking, what about like gameplay side? Was there any also any major iterations you had to do? Uh, yes. So one of the biggest problems that we faced, right, was that okay at the start we had this when when players were dead, they stayed dead until the end of the game, and we didn't fix this for a very long time because we were busy with uh, other parts of the game. So, the thing is, the game lasted for four to five minutes, and if you died, like let's say the first minute, you will have four fifths of the game where you are not doing anything. And we tried to, uh, downplay the problem by saying, "Oh man, go can pick up gems, ghosts can pick up items, and you know annoy the monster and stuff." But that wasn't enough for the play, right? Because in the end, they didn't have a chance to win any longer. They don't have any commitment to the game. So what we did was to shorten the, the loops and uh, every time it went back to the daytime, uh, players could resurrect into humans and, you know, able to progress uh, towards the goal of getting, let's say, 10 gems. So that's one of the biggest uh, mechanics, mechanical updates that we did. But... Uh, overall, for monsters and the general game loop of you know monsters chasing humans and humans running away from monsters trying to get gems, we didn't really change the the core concept. No. I see. Thanks. Yeah. the team's plans moving forward like in terms of career path um how about we let the artist talk first <laughs> <laughs> Simon please oh uh, okay um, <laughs> in terms of career progression uh i hope for me personally, I hope to continue with the game, uh, in the gaming industry and pursuing more character-based uh, career. Uh, as it shows in this game, I, I kind of made an agreement, you know, that we, it, by going into this game, I would be able to do a lot more character. And this was kind of my first 3D uh, game-making experience, and I think I completely loved it um, more than my previous experience with animation, the animation side of art in the first place because uh, working with programmers was actually programmers and designers itself was a very enjoyable experience um and yeah just yeah i think because of that i plan to hopefully work in more game more work on more games itself and continue doing character yeah wow well, right. yeah um for me yeah, I, I was the same as Simon. Like, I came into this project without knowing like really how 3D games were made. So, um, learning on the go and just going through all the mistakes and um, the successes, you know, sharing these with my friends, I think this pretty much sets me in the direction of the game industry as well. So, I'll definitely be looking towards like um, making art for AAA games or even indie games in the future. And I don't really mind, you know, what kind of field of work it is. It's all like different problems that I'm quite happy to solve. So yeah. If you know anyone that wants to hire artists, let us know. <laughs> right. We're always available. Let's see, how about yeah, how about designers now? Uh well, I'm working as an intern. <laughs> uh game design intern, so <laughs> This, nice. The career path is still the same. Uh, Tian Shou is also working as a level designer. Eh? Is it? <laughs> He's still interning, right? Oh, yeah, game I'm designer. Sure. Yeah, game designer at uh, UB. Yeah, Ubisoft. So, yeah, you can see him on articles, man. <laughs> millennial nice. Tan Tian Shou. Yeah, the millennial. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
Ivan, Mel. No other arrow. Okay, realistically, uh, I do not plan to work in games anytime soon. It. I came to Digital Japan because I wanted to make games, but uh, I sort of would like to build the capital before I go indie. I do have a game that I eventually want to make, which, but I would like to have creative control and it's sort of not sustainable for now, for me at least. So the plan is to earn money being a programmer and then come back sometime in my 40s. 40s. <laughs> Or whenever I can accumulate passive income to survive. <laughs> I have planned my life in 20 life stage, like 20 year stages, so Wow. Yeah. The next Who stage wants to go to a sixth stage? stage? Honestly, uh uh teach. Oh teach. Yeah, as a professor somewhere. It's not a question, but it's not a question, but I just realized I know Hengqi. <laughs> I made a rule. Hi Hengqi. <laughs> it's been five years. Okay, yeah, anyway, um thank you for the sharing. <laughs> it's my, if, my uh, he was my senior in school. Yes. If any of y'all have questions about the industry or like need advice on like your career path, right? Just feel free to post in Discord. Wherever. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.